thing now. There we go. All right, so I'm going to get us started. Um, if you've been to one of these, you've heard me do a similar introduction before, but I'm Jenny Dale, the Information Literacy Coordinator. I proposed this ULVLC to promote peer learning and build community during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that now we're pretty much all working remotely and I'm hoping that this gives us opportunities to learn and to share and to just kind of connect with each other, um, even though we're not at the library or at our libraries. So we will have an archived version of this session later at the uh, ULVLC uh, research guide, which I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat. So this is where we have our calendar of upcoming guides. Um, it's weird to me that that didn't come as a link, but that's fine, whatever. Um, it will have our upcoming uh, sessions. Nope, still the same thing. Um, that we have on our calendar and it gives you instructions for how to sign up, how to get the information that you need, um, and also has those archived sessions. So I am caught up with archived sessions. So everything up until today is there and available, um, along with slides when I have them. So uh, that's an option too. So I always like to say that um, if you have major tech issues today, I will absolutely try to help you solve them in the chat, but if I can't, we will absolutely have this up available online. I've gotten Anna's permission, so we will have um, this available online in case you miss parts of it. I know I've talked to a couple people who do have to leave uh, the session partway through, so you will be able to get to it later. Um, you are just logistically, you should have been muted on entry. Um, if you have questions throughout, whether it's a tech question or a content question, please use the chat. I see lots of us are using the chat already. I imagine we've got a lot of people here who are uh, pretty much Zoom experts at this point by how much we are using it. Um, but if you do have any tech issues, please let me know. So before I introduce our presenter for today, does anyone have any questions that they might want to put in the chat? Okay, not seeing any questions. I will go ahead and introduce our presenter. Uh, so this session is being hosted by Anna Kraft, coordinator of metadata services for UNCG University Libraries. And she's gonna be presenting on scholarly communication basics for library personnel. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Anna and I'm just gonna remind everyone to use the chat if you need to. Thank you, Jenny. And welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks to Jenny for setting up and facilitating these sessions and for giving people, including me, a chance to present. Um, so I'm gonna talk about scholarly communication and this is gonna be a pretty brief overview. Um, there's a lot more that we could say about this, but we will keep it brief today. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I also have a couple of points in the slides where I will ask for some feedback or comments from y'all. Um, Jenny, I'm having trouble with my slides. Okay, what's going on? They are not advancing. Uh -oh. oh. There we go. They're advancing oh, now. Good. Yes, all right, great. Okay, sorry about that. So I first wanna give some credit to ACRL from whom a couple of uh, some of the slide components are drawn from some ACRL workshops on scholarly communication. So this is me. I'm the coordinator of metadata services, but I also work on a lot of scholarly communication initiatives in the university libraries. And I am not the only one. This is really a group effort in the libraries. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is work that involves a lot of people in a lot of different departments. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to define what scholarly communication is and hopefully we will understand the importance of it on our campus and in the larger world. We'll talk about the research life cycle and components of scholarly communication work in an academic setting and then specific scholarly communication efforts that we are working on in the university libraries. So what is scholarly communication? This definition is from ACRL. 
the system through which research and other scholarly writings are created, evaluated for quality, disseminated to the scholarly community, and preserved for future use. So in other words, this is faculty, students, and others engaging in research, academic inquiry, undergoing peer review, and sharing what they have found, their results, and perhaps their data, <clears throat> excuse me, with the larger scholarly and academic community, and maybe the public too. And this includes and supports the research life cycle, which we will be talking about more as we move forward. So why is this important? Any thoughts from y'all on why this is important right now and in general? Ooh, ooh, pick me. <laughs> Megan. Um, because research can happen faster if everybody shares their data, like with COVID. Yes, yeah, exactly. So that is a great example. That is the same example that I have. So these are some very recent headlines when I search for scholarly communication and COVID-19. Um, publishers getting information out to people, the scholarly community uh, and its role in protecting healthcare workers through sharing information, and just in general, scholarly communication supporting the sharing of research and data um, related to the pandemic that we are all uh, witnessing going on right now. And I also want to highlight, so this is a screen cap from, I think, two days ago, and it's already somewhat out of date. When I looked at it today, this is from MedArchive and BioArchive. This is a preprint server for the health sciences and medical sciences. Um, when I looked at it uh, maybe yesterday, everything was, was very recent and all about COVID. But today, there even, there's even more stuff. Stuff is going up constantly. And I've got a little note down at the bottom that says, so this is a preprint server. Um, these reports are preliminary. They have not been peer reviewed. Uh, what this is, this is faculty and other researchers who are trying to get their research out quickly. Um, they wanna share what they're working on because it may have an impact soon, now, in terms of what other researchers are doing and trying and testing. Um, so these things have not been published yet. They, most of them have probably not been through peer review. And the publishing process can take a long time from getting an article completed and the research that underlies that, submitting that manuscript for peer review, getting it through peer review and edits, and finally getting published. It can take months to years for that to happen, which can really slow down the sharing of research. So we're in a situation where data and research is really important. So we've got a lot of researchers out there who are trying really hard to make their information available so that others can use it. So scholarly communications is crucial right now. Who is involved in this? Researchers, authors who submit papers and write them, administrators of uh, research and of higher education, students, editors of journals, peer reviewers, library personnel, and others. Lots of people are involved in this. And these are some of the systems that are involved. Higher education is definitely a big one. Scholarly communication is important for promotion and tenure in terms of people uh, publishing and get, making sure that there's impact, their work is impactful and they can get tenure. The publishing industry is a big part of this. Different disciplines and scholarly societies have different practices in this area that influence things. Social media can be a way to share research. The research industry, the intellectual property and legal system, and then funding and granting agencies that provide money to support research and publications. All of these are systems that are part of scholarly communications. So what library roles and functions contribute to scholarly communication efforts. Anybody have any ideas? Feel free to type them in the chat or turn on your mic and share. I believe Megan has her hand raised. Megan. I should give other people a chance to answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
<laughs> it's all right. Um, from my experience, it's mainly helping people pick somewhere to deposit this stuff. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, as researchers and authors complete their research and then they're looking for ways to share it, finding the appropriate archive or database um, to put that research in or the data in is an important part of this to make sure that everything gets shared. Any other thoughts? So Sam in the chat said, thinking about research and training scholars on the research cycle. Yes, definitely. So the research life cycle, which we will talk more about in just a moment, it has a lot of different pieces and components and teaching graduate students, undergrads, faculty about how that works contributes to the larger scholarly communication ecosystem. Um, so, and I will elaborate on this a little bit later, but basically everyone in the library can play a role in this area. So the research life cycle, what is it? I did a Google image search for research life cycle and you can see a whole bunch of different images here. There are some things that a lot of them have in common. They've got arrows, a lot of them are circular. They've got different pieces and components. Some of them um, may use some of the same language. Some of them are slightly different. But the point is that the research life cycle can take a lot of different forms. There are many types of research, many academic disciplines out there. People do research differently and they create or have end products that can be very different in different disciplines. So there's no one size fits all with the research life cycle. This is a very simple look at a, a basic research life cycle. You start with an idea, you do research on it, you create something, you share it, and give others the opportunity to find, consume, create new knowledge that might spark new ideas, which starts the whole process over. This is another slightly um, more complex view where you've got people generating ideas, going through peer review, sharing findings, libraries are acquiring research and preserving it, helping others to discover it and access it, and then that knowledge can then be assimilated and used to generate new ideas. This is an even more complicated look at a research life cycle where you've got little cycles within the larger cycle, different pieces from planning, to experiments, to publication, to um, disseminating and sharing work. So there, this can be a very complicated or simple process depending on how you wanna look at it and break it down. And again, I wanna um, reiterate that it's not one size fits all and neither are the final products. So a lot of disciplines do produce what we think of as traditional scholarship which is often that peer reviewed journal article or a monograph. But scholarship and scholarly products can take a lot of different forms. These could include musical performances, choreography, artistic works, websites, digital projects, databases, and more. And with us at UNCG being a campus that has a lot of art, um, visual and performing and other areas, we see a lot of different types of uh, research products and forms of the research life cycle. So it's good to be aware that this is happening and taking many different forms. So let's break it down. This is a very simple example and a somewhat humorous that I hope, hope somewhat humorous example that I hope everyone will enjoy. So starting off the research life cycle, I have an idea. My cat is great. So then I'm going to do research. Is my cat great? Going to go straight to some library databases, going to collect some data, going to find out if this Bootsy, my cat, is a great cat. And then I'm going to, based on my research and findings, write up what I have found and submit this manuscript to a peer-reviewed journal. So I 
have done a lot of research. I have gathered all my data. I have found, gotten findings together, which have, I have some conclusions. And um, this is really important, and I want others to be able to learn from it too. So I'm submitting it for peer review and hoping that a journal will be like, yes, this is amazing. We want to publish it. And then when it gets peer reviewed and accepted and published, I will be sharing my work um, here through the very fake International Journal of Excellent House Cats. Um, and then I might take my data set, many photographs of Bootsy and whatever other, other underlying data I have, and I might use uh, library services to help me archive, preserve, and share that data. And then others would be able to find and consume that data. So we've got our stick figure family. All of them have the International Journal of Excellent House Cats in hand, and they are learning and can go out and have new great ideas and contribute to scholarship through um, these great new ideas. Um, thank you for being here to enjoy photographs of Bootsy. All right, so getting back to more serious stuff, components of scholarly communications, an overview. Um, here we go, okay. So in libraries, what does scholarly communication work entail? It can take a lot of different forms and a lot of different people contribute to it. So author's rights, copyright, creative commons, fair use, scholarly publishing, some of these things have already come up in questions and discussions so far. Uh, institutional repositories, open access, open educational resources, helping people measure the impact of their research and supporting research data management. So these are some of the questions that might come up along the way when you're helping people with scholarly communications work. For people who are going up for promotion and tenure, they're probably going to be looking at tracking and, and demonstrating the impact of their work. For people who are new to the academic community, perhaps graduate students, they may want to learn about different models for peer review. Um, and again, people who may be new to academia maybe thinking about getting into publishing articles and wondering about what types of journals would be good publication venues for their work. There are questions like, why isn't all scholarship freely available? Why are that some things behind paywalls? Um, and then for those who publish, trying to understand the intricacies of copyright. So if I have published something, who holds copyright to it? This question might come up. What is fair use? That's especially important right now. What is an institutional repository? How can I legally share my published work? How do I choose and use a Creative Commons license? All of these things come up from time to time in scholarly communications work. So a question for all of y'all, what scholarly communication question, questions or issues have come up for you? Um, have you had questions from the previous slide? Have you had other types of questions? Anyone have anything that they want to share? Again, please feel free to share in the chat. Okay, so Megan, kind of a, a, a quote from a faculty member, can I copy this and post it on Canvas for my class? Um, Sam, publication quality, citation analysis. Excellent, the yeah. Metrics and alt metrics. Yes, yeah, these are all great examples. And y'all are exactly right. Um, whether or not something can be copied and shared on Canvas or another learning management system, whether it's legal, like how much of it could be shared, thinking about fair use with that. Definitely publication quality, citation analysis, scholar profiles, all of these things. Um, why things cost so much, definitely. So yeah, great examples, y'all. Thank you. And then Rachel mentioned considering reasons why things being shared isn't always best. Yes, yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Anna, can I ask a, a quick uh, question yeah. that was from Charlie a little bit earlier? Mm -hmm. um, so Charlie asked, how short could this life cycle be? Like the, I think the research life cycle. So I, for it to be part of the, the truly scholarly communication life cycle, I think it would probably need to include the components that we looked at. I'm gonna go right back to my brief example, um, something are like this. I mean, you're going to have an idea. You have to do research. You have to create something. Part of scholarly communication is really sharing it as well um, so that others can find and consume it. And peer review is going to be part of this too. It may or may not be shown. It's not shown on this one, but peer review is, is pretty important to scholarly communication. That what's, that's something that separates it from just general like news media or um, other things that may not be have that academic component. Um, so it can be a very long, complicated process, but it can also be broken down to a pretty short one like this. Now we'll get to see Bootsy again. Um, all right. So let's talk about some scholarly communication efforts at UNCG. A lot of people work on scholarly communications here. Um, we have a libguide. I'm gonna go through each of these things on sub subsequent slides. Um, so starting with the libguide, <clears throat> Beth created this before she, uh, before she left UNCG. And I have taken over it and done some updates and added some things. Um, but a lot of it is, is based on Beth's work, which is awesome. Um, so this is a good place to start if you've got scholarly communication questions from faculty or students. There's a lot of information here. I hope at some point to have a little bit more time to, to do some work on this and um, some updating on all these things. Um, these are some resources that we use in terms of helping people with thinking about author rights. The Creative Commons site provides a good author addendum document. Um, so that one is linked on there. Creative Commons is also great for helping choose a license if people are thinking about how they want to share their work and how they want other people to be able to use their work. The Creative Commons licenses are a great way to go to um, make those decisions clear to, how, to others on how they can use and share your works. Sherpa Romeo is something that the NC Docs team uses a lot, but individuals can use it as well in determining what uh, copyright policies different publishers and journals have. So if you want to learn about which journals might allow open access and more um, open sharing, that's a good resource to use. We do a lot of training on open access. This is a slide from an open access talk that I have done a couple of times just with a basic definition. Open access, it's research outputs which are distributed online and free of cost or other barriers such as like paywalls. So um, that's something that we do training on. NC Docs is our open access institutional repository and a lot of people at, uh, in the libraries are involved in this. We've got Tiffany, Marcy, Callie, Alyssa, and others who work on this. And it's a great place to find completely open access scholarship from UNCG faculty and students. The example on the slide shows Nora Bird from the LIS uh, department. And if we scrolled down there, we would see some more of her um, works, which are all freely available in NC Docs. We, okay, we also have an open access publishing fund and Christine is in charge of this and she works with Amy and Fatih from LIS. We offer some grants to offset the cost of publishing in open access journals. So some journals that share open access scholarship charge what's called article processing charges and that sort of, I could talk a lot about those, but that sort of replaces the cost of subscriptions to content um, because there's still a lot of there's still a lot of work that goes into publishing and creating and sharing those that work although perhaps not as much as publishers uh, 
are making off of it. Anyway, um, so we can help faculty and graduate students with APC charges up to $1,000 and the libraries and ORE are sponsoring that fund. So we've got a link there at the bottom to learn more about that. We also um, increasingly we are providing more transformative deals. And this is an area where Tim and the Carolina Consortium have been very active. So this is pretty new on the scholarly communications LibGuide. Um, so these are, are publishers that we're working with on like getting credits for faculty for article processing charges or getting those APCs waived for certain publishers or getting discounts. So this is something that Tim can talk about at length, uh, but these are some different models for providing funding for making articles open access. We also work on OER as part of scholarly communication. And this is something that Sam and Melody and Michelle and others are very involved in. So if you go to the OER tab on the scholarly communications uh, LibGuide, you get taken to a separate OER LibGuide that I believe Melody and Sam run. So there's a lot of information there for helping people find, uh, locate OERs, learn about what they are, and think about how they might implement them in their classes. Research data is another area. This is something that we haven't been as active in um, since Linda's departure, but we are hoping to hire a new data services librarian. And so uh, Linda and I, and now I, uh, on my own, perhaps with some others occasionally, uh, work on some data management planning resources, uh, research data hosting, and some related things for faculty. And I'm really hoping that we can hire a new data services person to help out with this, because it is not uh, my area of expertise. Um, so yeah, that's something we're hoping to develop more as we move forward. Um, Research identity, which Sam mentioned earlier, is an area where we have done more uh, workshops recently on helping faculty and students share and raise the profile of their research. So these are some of the systems that we provide training on and some of the systems that we can help people share their work with. Um, and then journals, thinking about which journals are good um, solid publication venues and which ones might be exploitative, might be charging those article processing charges and um, not actually providing any of the value like peer review or layout or anything. So this is a graphic that I like from SUNY Stony Brook and um, it's pretty small in here, but y'all can look it up afterwards if you'd like to see more of the details. So there are lots of different ways to evaluate journals. Um, many of the liaisons also are active in this area. I know Leah has done some work on this. So helping, um, and Megan mentioned this earlier too, helping people think about um, and evaluate places to put their scholarship. Metrics and impact, which Sam mentioned. So these are all important for uh, promotion and tenure and perhaps for people who are graduate students who might be looking for jobs. So um, citation analysis, this is how many times your publications have been cited by others. Impact of your journal. So if your journal has a high impact factor that can add prestige to, um, to your work. Alternative metrics. So this includes social media and tracks how perhaps things are being shared on Twitter and other platforms. And there are many other metrics out there. So depending on which discipline, what kind of scholarship, how it's being shared, we can help faculty and others determine what metrics might be the most helpful for them. So what about everybody in the library? When you assist students, faculty, and others in developing their research questions and finding and retrieving literature and sharing their work um, and in archiving their publications, their data, other components, all these things are helping support scholarly communications and the research lifecycle. So when I said earlier that basically everyone is involved, this is, um, y'all are all part of this. 
So, and, and anyone who works at a public service desk or offers research consultations or otherwise works directly with researchers may get questions about all kinds of scholarly communications issues. Why is this especially important now? So lots of people are looking for information on the pandemic that we are all in the midst of right now. And scholarly communications can help. So researchers may be thinking about how they can share their publications or their data sets in the most open manner so that people who need it can access it. The COVID-19 public health emergency has actually affected fair use and copyright in terms of what can be shared for classes um, online. I'm not an expert on that, but I have been reading a few things on that. So this is, it's a pretty interesting thing that's developing. Um, people may be looking for the most recent peer reviewed research or the most recent research that is available as a preprint or people may be trying to increase the visibility of their own work that's related to this pandemic. So scholarly communication, this whole life cycle, um, we can look at it through this lens right now. And while it's, kind of, it's a scary time, um, scholarly communication is a great example of, <clears throat> or a great, it shows the importance of scholarly communication in this situation. So if you get questions about scholarly communications at UNCG, the LibGuide is always there. Subject liaisons in ROI are a great place to start depending on what discipline. Um, and then you can ask me if you've got questions. And now I will ask y'all, do you have any questions? So there was one question in the chat and it was from Mac who's wondering if Bootsy is accepting applications for membership on his research team. Um, Bootsy is very selective about who he works with. So I'll, I'll talk to him afterward, but I can't make any promises. Thank you though for the interest. So um, Charlie is mentioning Sarah's question earlier about why things cost so much. I think that Sarah was using that as an example of a question that might have been asked of her by faculty. Mm -hmm. um, but Sarah, you can, okay, great. I was going to say you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you beat me to correcting me that I'm right. So, all right, any other questions that people might have? Things you might want to know, questions you've had, lingering, burning questions about scholarly communication? So um, y'all can always email me if questions come up and the, there are links to the resources that were shared here. Um, so the slides will be available. Um, thank you to everyone for coming and participating and enjoying my photographs of Bootsy. Um, I didn't tell him that he was gonna be an example in a presentation, but I'm sure that he will be thrilled. And I'll just put in a shameless plug that Anna mentioned OER, Open Education Resources. Um, Sam, Michelle, and Melody are going to be doing a session next, I believe it's next Wednesday, um, for the ULVLC about that very topic. Um, so I, if you want to continue to learn more, there are lots of connections between sort of scholarly communication generally and OER specifically. So if no one has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>